Hello, welcome back to our conversations about spirituality. So happy that you uh, decided to drop in and that you're with us this day as we continue this uh, important conversation. Again, I want to thank all those that have participated and continue to participate. I think it's a good sign that um, we've increased our numbers as this conversation continues, which is a better sign, I guess, than if we decreased numbers and nobody was watching. Uh, so that's a good thing. I thank you very much for your participation. And I thank you also for the questions. I was hoping that there'd be uh, questions that had more to do in a dialogue sense, more in the way that a conversation might necessarily take place, not as a monologue, uh, but as a dialogue. Uh, but evidently, um, that's not the way that you want to go. That's not the way you want to proceed. And the questions that you ask are mainly questions that lend themselves more to clarification than to any sort of expansion of the topic. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, for that participation and for your continued response to uh, what we're trying to do as we gather together each day um, and consider this very important uh, subject. We've been going now for uh, 10 sessions. This is our 10th session, and we should be able to wrap this up in about two or three more sessions. And then this particular uh, subject matter will be concluded. Uh, don't worry, uh, we're ready to start a new subject uh, and a new conversation uh, following this one. And I'll give you the details of that on the uh, website so that you can prepare and uh, see if it might be something that you're interested in. Our conversation about spirituality has arrived at the point where we need to, to break away from talking about uh, becoming aware of God we need to uh, break away from the idea of uh, practices and disciplines as one response to our growing awareness of God. Not to say that those aren't important. They're extremely important. And we've spent uh, a good deal of time considering them. But the next point of connection that uh, lends itself to our conversation this morning uh, is a point of connection that leads us away from a smaller focus and invites us into a larger focus. It invites us to, to kind of step back and uh, begin to see the world, uh, human experience, uh, relationships, um, all that we are in a, a, a different light. Uh, so that's what we're going to try to do this morning. We're going to try to, to break away uh, from what is in front of our face and perhaps begin to see things in a little different way. I'm reminded of a movie that came out, um, oh, it's got to be 10 or 15 years ago now. I don't, maybe even longer than that, I hate to admit. It was an animated movie, and um, it had the voices of, I, I wrote them down here, the voices of Woody Allen, Sharon Stone, Gene Hackman, Sylvester Stallone, Christopher Walken, and Jennifer Lopez. And they were all in it, and um, the animated movie was called Ants. And in this particular uh, animation, Woody Allen portrays a very weak ant who falls in love with the princess. And uh, he's informed that as a worker ant, there's no way he can possibly ever hope uh, to meet the princess, let alone fall in love with her or enter into any type of relationship with her. And that sets the basic story because, as you might imagine, um, he is going to meet his love and he is going to fall in love with her. But there's going to be all sorts of adventures along the way. And the adventures are not as important as, from our perspective, as the last part of the movie. When the movie's over and they're giving the credits in the movie, as they give the credits in the movie, they begin to pull the camera back from what you've been watching for the last 90 minutes. And as they pull the camera back, you realize that for the last 90 minutes of your life, you have been focused on all of the activities, the emotions, the plotting, the victories, the defeats, 
everything that takes place within the constant of a single anthill, a very small anthill in perspective. And as the camera pulls back, you begin to see that there's many other ant holes. But for the last 90 minutes, you've only been aware of what's been going on in that anthill. And then the camera pulls back even more, and you realize that it is in the middle of a large field. Camera pulls back even further, and you see that the field is Central Park in New York. The camera pulls back even further, and you begin to see the outlines of the state of New York and the ocean. It pulls back until finally you see the universe as we know it, our world floating in the universe. And you see a much bigger picture. And that perspective uh, is an invitation to change. It's an invitation to see a little bit differently. It reminds us of how we can get so caught up in the smallest detail of something. And even though all this other energy and all this other activity and all this other life and everything else is all around us, we have a tendency to concentrate just in our particular anthill. It's been that way. It's, it's a way human beings live. It's a way that we perceive life. It's a way that we navigate life. But we're called to do something more. We're called, uh, especially uh, by the life of Jesus, we're called to live with a different perspective. <coughs> Excuse me. And that different perspective is a perspective that invites us to lift up our heads, to take our focus away from all those things that dominate us, that distract us, uh, that perhaps uh, enliven us or perhaps challenge us, whatever our perspective does for us, to lift up our head, to get our head out of our particular anthill, and at the very least to begin to acknowledge and to see that there's more to life than just what's in front of our face. Jesus invited his disciples to do that. And he said that when you lift up your head, when you begin to walk with your head erect and you begin to walk as a child of God, you're no longer oppressed by the Romans. You're no longer beaten down by those who have more than you are. Uh, you're no longer, you're changed. It doesn't mean that you deny reality. It doesn't mean that you go through life whistling like and pretending that nothing's happening to you. No, that's not what lifting up your head means. But it means that you change your perspective. You spend more time working on what can be done and how you can choose and how you can live uh, rather than spending time on what you can't do and what you have no control over. There's many different ways that we learn this lesson and there's many different ways that we can experience this lesson. And each of them are always an invitation to us uh, to begin to see in a different way. I remember years ago, I was in uh, Berkeley, California, and I was uh, there for a sabbatical. In fact, I was writing a book at the time, and I needed a, a few months to finish the book and to get it ready in order to send it in to the publisher so that it could be uh, published. And it, eventually it was, but nevertheless, during the time I spent in Berkeley, the neighborhood in which I lived was very near the University of California at Berkeley which is a wonderful um, university. And I noticed as I was walking around the neighborhood and walking around the university, a very thick catalog was on uh, street stands throughout the downtown area of Berkeley. So one day after being there a couple weeks, I stopped and I picked up on these catalogs. And the catalog was a catalog that offered all the adult education that was uh, available for anybody who wanted to go to it from the University of California, plus all the theological seminaries and everything that was in the area. Anybody could go to these for a very small fee or, or many times no fee at all. And there was so much unbelievable amount of subjects and themes that you could pursue. And so in the process of going through the catalog, one particular uh, class caught my attention. And the class was all about the Hubble telescope. And it said that this was going to be a uh, class that showed you in one night. These are only adult education snippets. So it was about three and a half hours it was planned for. And they would show you what the Hubble telescope was, what it um, discovered, and then you can enjoy uh, the results of 
this great invention. And I thought that was something I was interested in doing, so I scouted it out. I went up to the university, found the lecture hall that the class was going to be in, and uh, arranged so that I could park my car in the interval between the time the students left and the evening classes began. So there was just enough time to get a parking spot. If you waited too long, there'd be no way you could get a parking spot. I went and grabbed some supper. It's a little place very close to the uh, lecture hall. And then the time came for the lecture hall and I went into the lecture hall and the lecture hall was quite large. Uh, it was a regular lecture hall at the university, but it probably seated about 500 students, I would imagine. Uh, so I went in and I found a seat somewhere in the middle and sat down. And when I sat down, um, I was one of the first ones to get there. I was a little early, but as it came closer and closer to the time for the uh, class to begin, it started filling up. And one of the first things I noticed was it was filling up with people who were much younger than me, a lot younger than me. Uh, I was sitting there and I was probably by far the oldest person in the uh, classroom. And I thought that was kind of strange because it was supposed to be an adult education course and it was filled with all sorts of other people, but it didn't look like senior citizens like I was. But nonetheless, the place filled up and that was fine. And then um, it came time for the class to start and uh, they turned the lights down in the room so that you could see the platform where the teacher was. And the teacher walked out I swear to God, she was 14 years old. She couldn't have been much older than that. You know, just very young, very spry. Came out and started talking, and within two or three minutes, I understood that I was in over my head. I did not understand what she was talking about. I had no idea what any of it meant. And I remember sitting there saying to myself, here you are, you're stuck in the middle of the auditorium, for the next three and a half hours, and there's way, no way you're going to get out of here. So I said, well, okay, I, another bad decision than perhaps in my life. So she talked for about 30 minutes, and again, I, I tried very hard to understand. I un Every once in a while, she used the word telescope or Hubble or universe or cosmos, but a lot of other times she was using mathematical formulas and all sorts of other things. And then, all of a sudden, much to my surprise, all of a sudden, the lights went completely down, and we looked up on the ceiling, and I didn't realize it, but the ceiling was a projected ceiling. And there, for the next three hours, were pictures that were taken of the Hubble telescope, by the Hubble telescope. And they were pictures of the universe, of our cosmos, of the making of stars and planets and galaxies. And so for the next three hours, I sat there and I looked at pictures of the world that surrounds me a world that I was uh, completely unaware of. It didn't mean because I was unaware of it that the world didn't exist. It meant that I was unaware of it. And that's one of the first lessons that you learn when you begin to change your attention, when you begin to change your focus. You understand, perhaps even for the first time in your life, that the reality that surrounds you is not dependent on your permission. It's not dependent on your participation. It's not dependent on your awareness. Uh, the world around you, the universe around you, is going to survive and thrive and grow and create and all the other things it's supposed to do, whether or not you're part of it. But if you're part of it, then you can be part of the energy and the creation and the uh, imagination uh, that you can see in all of that beauty and all of that wonder. So the presentation was over and I went home and I spent the next couple of days just thinking about what I had seen. And it was just absolutely overwhelming. I had never really thought about the universe in that way. I never really thought about solar systems and galaxies and the cosmos and stars. And I must say that um, it really changed my opinion about many things and uh, challenged me and invited me uh, to think in a completely different way. And I was talking to some of the redemptors I was living with at the time, and I think they got really, really tired of listening to me talk about how wonderful the cosmos is, how big the universe is, and how big numbers are that we hadn't even begun to imagine. And they, they put up with me for a while, but then they got tired of it. 
So I learned uh, not to say anything more about it. Anyways, a couple of weeks later, I found another program that seemed of some interest to me. And I was even more particularly interested in it because of the fact that it was in the same lecture hall. I knew how that worked. I knew how to get to the lecture hall. I knew how to park. I knew where I was going to eat. And this time I was going to go to a lecture and this was all about um, some sort of, a, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Uh, I guess an atomic um, accelerator microscope or something huge microscope uh, that has the ability to uh, look into cells and appear into cells and um, see things that you couldn't even begin to see. So anyways, I was kind of interested in that. And uh, so I went in and I sat in the lecture hall and waited. And sure enough, all these people came in. And sure enough, I was the oldest one by far in the lecture hall. But I was okay with that. I knew how the other one turned out. And so I just sat there and waited. And came time for the teacher to come out. And she came out again. And this, she was even younger than the first one was. I couldn't believe how young she was. And she was very small, not very big at all. Uh, large voice, very big, booming voice, and she obviously knew what she was talking about. And then she started talking, and I didn't understand a word what they were talking about. Uh, different theories, and quantum this, and quantum that, and physics this, and but I didn't care, because I figured there's going to be pictures. The pictures are going to come eventually. And sure enough, after she talked for about 45 minutes, the lights went out, and the pictures came up. And this time, instead of the vast universe, this time the pictures showed another universe. It showed the universe that this electron microscope or atomic microscope or whatever kind of microscope it was, was able to look into the human cells and look into the human body and the vastness of it and the, the unbelievableness of it. And, the awe, and I remember sitting there and I was just as overwhelmed by the magnitude of the immensity of the cells and all the things that were going on within the human body as I was when I was looking at the universe. And again, I was very much aware of the fact that it was not dependent on me whatsoever. Even though within my body all this was going on, I wasn't aware of it, but it was still going on. Um, it was still very much a part of who I was as a human being and part of my experience. Again, it invited me to something more. It invited me not only to, to see the big picture and to lift up my head and see the vastness of the universe, it invited me also to pay attention to the smallest picture, the smallest details. Because even in the smallest, most minute thing, there can be a wonderful mystery. There can be an invitation to something wonderful. But again, you have to pay attention. You have to actually pay attention to what's going on around you. Or perhaps a better way of saying it is, you're invited. You're invited by grace. You're invited by the Spirit of God. You're invited by curiosity, imagination. However you want to call it, however you want to see it, you're invited uh, to pay attention, uh, not to take it for granted. And in the process of becoming more focused and more aware of all that is around you, the bigger picture and the smaller picture, which is also filled with the uniqueness of God's mystery and God's life and love, there's a per tremendous spiritual lesson to be learned, a spiritual lesson about the permeation, and this is from the Christian perspective, the permeation of God's grace that is everywhere and in everything. It reminded me of the time that... Uh, the Acts of the Apostles uh, tells a story about St. Peter standing on the roof and all these animals come towards him that he considered to be unclean. And he begins to reject them and reject them and reject them. And the voice of God says to him, don't, don't call anything that I have created unclean. I created it. It's not unclean. It reminded me of that story because there is everything within the experience of who we are as human beings. If, in fact, what Teilhard de Chardin has said to us, and I believe that it's true, that we're spiritual beings having human experiences, 
then all of those experiences, everything that we are, all that we're called to be, can call us to a fuller awareness of the presence of God, can call us into a deeper awareness and appreciation of what God has given us. And so as we widen our perspective and as we learn to focus on those things around us, then we begin to learn and we begin to develop. Here's a story from Jesus. Um, and as usual, some of his most important stories are the ones that come to him, uh, come to us as a result of the scribes and the Pharisees challenging him and uh, poking him and daring him to say something profound. And this is what he says. I am the light of the world. And no one who follows me stumbles around in the darkness. I provide light to live in. Jesus replied, You have my word, and you can depend on it being true. I know where I've come from and where I go next. You don't know where I'm from or where I'm headed. You decide according to what you can see and touch. I don't make judgments like that. But even if I did, my judgments would be true because I wouldn't make it out of the narrowness of my experience, but rather in the largeness of the one who sent me, the Father, that fulfills the conditions set down in God's law. And that is what you have. You have my word, and you have the word of the Father who sent me. So Jesus is rejecting the scribes and the Pharisees who are trying to call him back into a smaller vision, who are trying to call him back into a particular way of understanding things, of a particular way of doing things. And Jesus says, no, no, I'm not going to give up the vastness of my relationship with my Heavenly Father. I am not going to give up the creation and the imagination, the life and the beauty of the world in which I live. I'm not going to fall for your little story. There's a much bigger story a much bigger reality, and that is what I'm going to spend my time with. That is how I'm going to live, and that's what I'm going to invite my disciples and my apostles to see. Jesus talks about this movement. He talks about it not as a movement in awareness. He doesn't talk about it as a change in perspective. He talks about it rather as moving from light, from darkness, from not being able to see into the light. So this movement uh, is that dramatic. Uh, so just imagine what it would be like to live your life in complete, total darkness. Just imagine like stumbling around your bedroom at night trying to, to find something. and You can hit your toe on something or you can trip over something that you forgot is there because you're in the darkness. Then imagine looking and doing the same task in the light. The whole thing changes. The reality changes because you move from the darkness into the light. So what Jesus is talking about is this change in perspective, this entrance into intimacy with my Father, this entrance into believing that the kingdom of God is not something that's beyond you, but rather it's something that is within you. It's something that you can feel. It's something that you can touch. That It's something that you can experience. That is a movement from the darkness into the light. That's the difference. And he says, when he teaches his disciples he, about this, once you've seen the light, you don't hide it in a drawer. Okay, You put it on a lampstand so those entering the room have light to see what they're doing. He said, your eye is a lamp lighting up your whole body. And if you live wide-eyed in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dark cellar. Keep your eyes open, your lamp burning, so you don't get musty and murky. Keep your life as well lighted as your best lighted room. So Jesus says it's not enough to just simply to be invited out of the darkness into the light. And as wonderful as the experience is to enter into the light, it's not enough to just experience that and then go back to your old way of living. What you have to do and what you're invited to do by the power of God's grace in life is to remain in the light 
and to let that light begin to show in your life where all the murkiness is, where all the disasters might be, where all are all the things that you've pushed aside or, or hidden, where are the challenges, where are the, where, where everything about true human light, all seen by the light that the gospel gives us, all seen by the light that Christ gives us, all brought from the darkness into the light, and not in a way that makes you ashamed, not in a way that makes you embarrassed, uh, but rather in a way that helps you become even more focused on the power of God's grace, the power of God's life, and the power of God's love. That's the movement from the smallest picture into the bigger picture. It's the movement from moving from what little bit you think you have to what you think you have to protect into something that's much bigger, into something that's much more life-giving, into something that is filled with God's grace and filled with God's blessing. So the connection point uh, that you're called to do, that you're invited to do, is to move once you become aware of God and once you begin practices and disciplines that sharpen your awareness and your focus and your mindfulness about God, it makes you move into a bigger picture, into letting you see. Um, and as you move into letting you see, then uh, you begin to change. Now let me tell you something that um, is difficult in a sense to talk about in this process. Um, but um, perhaps if I, I tell a story, um, that might be a way to illustrate it. An old monk and a young monk were out walking one day in the monastery. And the young monk was talking to the old monk all about his spiritual journey and how he was beginning to see things differently and understand and stuff that he didn't think made sense now was beginning to make sense. So he had that initial enthusiasm that you have as you enter more and more into God's light and wonder as you begin to see the, the manifestation of God's grace. And at some point in the conversation, the, the old monk was just listening very patiently to the young monk's enthusiasm. At some point in the conversation, the young monk looked at the old monk and he says, Why is it, Reverend Father, why is it that people start the spiritual journey? They see all this wonderful stuff, and then they abandon it. Why do they give up? And just at that moment, the... Um, Old monk was going to answer, and all of a sudden a rabbit runs in front of them. And right behind the rabbit is a pack of dogs following the rabbit, yelping all the way. They wait a half a second, and another pack of dogs comes running past them, yelping again. So the old monk says to the young monk, he says, now watch, watch, be patient, watch what happens. So they stop and they wait, and sure enough, a couple minutes later, a pack of dogs comes back into the monastery garden and goes back and sleeps under the porch where they were. And the old monk looks at the young monk and he says, see that pack of dogs? That pack of dogs never saw the rabbit. All they heard was the barking. They never saw the rabbit. Why is it that people begin the spiritual journey, or they engage in the spiritual journey, and they begin to do these wonderful things, why is it that they seemingly give up, or don't progress, or seem to be satisfied with where they are? Because they've never seen the rabbit. All they heard is the barking. One of the things that happens as you, with God's grace, as your focus begins to widen and as you can see things that you didn't see before and as you can revel in the fact that there's so much mystery and wonder and beauty and blessedness in the world in which you live is not to become distracted by all the shiny objects. That is only the expression one of the expressions of the person that you seek. Remember, it is a relationship. 
a relationship with a person. You're trying to connect with a person, a living person, a being. Don't be distracted by all that you think you see and all that you think you've learned. Pay attention to what is in the middle of it all. The uh, old philosophers, the systematic theologians would talk about it as the center, the ground of being, the presence of God itself. So you pay attention to what energizes, what enables, what calls forth, and not to get distracted by everything around you. Tomorrow when we continue, we're not going to talk about the big picture and the small picture. We're going to talk about the experience that leads a person to distraction. Why would you settle for the yelping and not go for the, the, the voice itself? What happens? And we know from people who have been on the spiritual journey before that there's a profound experience within this experience that is there, um, but it needs some attention to, and it needs some real guidance. So tomorrow, we'll continue our conversation, and we'll talk about that. Have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow.